Next up we have um, Professor Paul James, who joins us from um, Melbourne, Australia. He's the director of the UN Global Compact Cities Program um, at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. And um, what we have in mind for the next half hour is a kind of open forum that will start with some comments um, by Paul and then uh, our discussion um, and then finally some closing remarks thereafter. Um, so. My role was to take notes during the day and to try and talk about what you were projecting as alternatives, what you were projecting as the kinds of issues that people need to take account of if we were to develop a positive and projective response to the kinds of problems. So what we were good at, and academics and, and corporate uh, research leaders are often very good at talking about the problems, we did that brilliantly, and then what I've tried to do is summarise the kinds of things which we need to do about it which we've done um, moderately well. That is, we've actually set up a series of proposals about some things that need to be done. They were built into the discussions in such a way they weren't lifted out. But forgive me if I've misplaced people or made a sense of them. And what I'll try and do is, is just generate a sense of the overview of that. So the first thing we talked about mostly was integration and dialogue. And the first of those things within integration and dialogue is a general thing which was directed mostly at governments, mostly at integration and dialogue amongst government departments and so on, but I'll come back to that. The second one, which we talked about a lot, was partnerships and collaboration. Oh, is it? Okay. The second thing we talked about was partnerships and collaboration. And in relation to partnerships, they were ones which varied across public-private partnerships, and partnerships with, which were with civil society and governments. And then thirdly, we started to talk about the way in which knowledge and analysis was the key to an alternative way of dealing with it. So in a way, it's not particularly novel. We all talk about these things, and those three dimensions add up to what we all agree on. In fact, if we start going through the details of what we're starting to say is very important, when you get people in rooms like this, it tends to have the same kinds of responses. It tends to be that we need more integration and dialogue. And as one speaker says, we've been talking about joined up government for three decades, and yet it's still not happening. So in sense of that, the first organisational thing which was talked about was organisational integration. We need to coordinate decision making across the different levels of government, different departments, and across different hierarchies in the way in which they work. But the second one, which has been talked about more now, is temporal integration. Not just the idea of having people talk to each other within dialogue, but the idea that time becomes important, that planning is across time, and that time has to be across longer scales than simply a three-year scale. It means we're talking about continuities between budgets and plans, and policy needs a 10-year horizon. Now, as you hear me speaking, all you're hearing is me quoting you back at yourself. So there's nothing I'm saying in here that you haven't heard already. All I'm doing is put it into a, a, a different framework. The third was a communicative integration. Not just communication, telling people what we're doing, but also a communicative integration which brings together consultation with telling people what is happening, and also generating a sense of what that means in terms of the outcomes and how that relates to project outcomes in a way that policy makes a difference. That then led to the partnerships and collaboration question. The first one was around civil and government relations. And in that, there were some quite complex statements about the nature of that, because a lot of the ways in which government civil society relations have been happening in the past is about micromanagement of those relationships. Micromanagement of them so you take risk analysis of when communication of outcomes becomes dangerous for you and you work out how you can manage the micro relations. What was being talked about was not just a management of those, but rather drawing upon the self-organisation of local communities, which seem to offer richer alternatives, particularly when it's linked to asset management tools and the toolkits of engagement. So that starts to bring together ideas that we need 
process tools for doing both the integration form that I talked about previously and the partnership form that I'm talking about now. Now, in the public-private partnerships, although these were hints rather than strongly directly said, everybody loves public-private partnerships, but there's still a concern about them. So what was the concern? Reading between the lines, it was a critique of the current dominant way in which public-private partnerships work, where the emphasis is on a singular contractual relationship between a government and a corporation, and where the risk is taken by the government and the profit is oriented towards the corporation, rather turning towards more integrated, cooperative relations between governments and corporations in a larger context of project planning. And so it doesn't become singular objects which are produced, but in fact projects which are produced which link together outcomes in a more considerate way. A project which is an overpass, a freeway, or even a, uh, an environmentally sensitive transport system doesn't work unless it's part of a more generic, connected form of public-private partnership. Knowledge and analysis, as you described it, was much more complicated. And the first one was around simulation. We need model building, computer visualizations using big data, which accurately simulate urban complexity. Secondly, we need learning. There should be social investment in lifelong learning at a local level, including governments that are open to joint responsibility and cooperation with civil society groups, such as foundations. But not just learning of that kind, which is learning in civil society, but also learning in government with training of higher level managers around project management. We also need interpretation. We need leaders with strong vision and well-trained managers with strong implementation skills. There should be a highly articulated common set of goals and indicators across departments. An accountability framework which is evidence-based. We need a joining up of analysis, policy and design. These things are rarely drawn into the same frame. And data needs to be linked to good decision-making processes. And I can give you lots of examples of that, but I won't. But one of them was around the health care service, and you can remember that. Another one was around the transport development, particularly regional development, and putting together core nodes with regional peripheries. We also need research-based scholars involved in engaged analysis. So that interpretation question came to the fore. And then, lastly, planning. And everybody was taking that for granted. Planning has come back in. The words plan, plan, plan were used as if it was a bit like location, location, location. If you repeat it enough, people will agree with you. So there was the sense that planning was a key. Now, in all of that, and I think everybody in this room, I think, will agree with those as the dominant things. What we lacked in the discussion, I think, was the principles for judging what is good integration, what are good partnerships, and what is good analysis. So we didn't have enough time, and a day is not enough time to go into those basic principles. And we didn't probably spend enough time on what are we doing it for. So principles being one of them, what are the principles which are the principles of judgment. We talked a lot about data, indicators, judging whether something is working or not. We didn't talk about what the principles are for doing the thing in the first place. And secondly, we didn't talk enough about the ways in which this is all intended for an outcome. It's intended to make something. But we didn't say what that thing was. We said making better cities or bringing about a more robust or prosperous economy. But we didn't say what it meant to have a more robust or, or prosperous economy. Did it simply mean, as the Chinese example, ever upward increase in return on investment through massive leveraging of the things which are actually going to cause a crisis in the end, or is it something else? I and mean, that's the sort of things. So I'll just leave you with one example. I want to return to the, the systems of urban governance. So it's just an area which I work on. So um, forgive me, I, I'm just picking on this because it's a, an area which I wanted to talk about. One of the speakers talked about the main subsystem, subsystems of the, of the city. It's a big project. It's working on the main subsystems. It says all the right things. We need bottlenecks. Uh, model building, computer visualization, and so on. We need to use big data. We need to link the subsystems and work out how they're integrated. It had all the discussion that we had in those forms. And yet, I fundamentally agree with the very starting point of the whole thing. Now, we haven't had time. And that's what it suggests about a day like today. It's the starting point rather than it's the end point. It's the starting point of discussion which has to go back to those very basics about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to act upon. Because if you said that the main subsystems are the city, and we asked everybody 
in private booths so they couldn't actually consult with their colleagues about what are the main subsystems of the city. Um, it would tend to be that most of us would say transport, communication, connections, economic systems, and so on. But there'd be a few people who would add some things in which were not in this basic subsystems list. Cultural values, the rich identity of a city, um, the complex ideals and visions and hopes of people as they go about their everyday life, things which are quite different. The main subsystems of this city were population systems, transport and communication systems, and economic systems. But what about the ecology of the city? It wasn't in there as a subsystem of the city. So for me, there are lots of places which we have got to today which require us to go back to basics. And so therefore, I open it up for discussion about where are we going, what are we trying to achieve, and what are the basics we need to talk about. We've got about 15 minutes. <laughs> So debates and discussion, yes. A quick question for you as an Australian, if you don't want to answer it, don't. But in listening to you talk about partnership, collaboration, public private partnerships, uh, not just you know, for an object and so on, uh, I couldn't help thinking of, of the things I've read, which are rather contradictory, yeah. about alliance contracting, which is something Australia has, has been moving towards in many spheres. Do you have a view on it? Is it a better model? What does it take to make it work? When does it not work? Um, it's not working in Australia. Public private partnerships are not working in Australia because they're being used as mechanisms for politicians to make difficult decisions and then to put that back into a contractual relationship, however complex it becomes, which defers the possibility of critical debate about the thing in the first place. So the alliance, uh, alliance systems you're talking about are putting together different forms of tendering arrangements, which are, are better than the single tendering arrangements of single company contracting, because they're starting to think about them as more complex projects. But if I use the two big examples uh, that are on the cards at the moment, we just contracted for $56 billion to build a desalination plant for the city of Melbourne. It was a, a problem which was caused by uh, climate change, who knows what that means in relation to the consequences of climate change, but it was caused by a drought linked to La Nina and the effect of that was to say we needed to act fast. A government decided that it needed to get a consultancy to say what it needed to do. That consultancy said it had to happen through this mechanism and then one company is building this $56 billion desalination plant, whereas that could have been done by many other ways. And I think going back to early discussions of transport infrastructure claims, it could have been done by multiple contracting around collection of water, stormwater recycling, a thousand other things, rather than a single basis to a single solution to a water vulnerability which had been caused by actually running down infrastructure over a 30-year period. Melbourne is located in an extraordinarily um, drought-based area, as is the whole of Australia, and yet what we're seeing is an intensification of that with floods in the northern parts of Australia and drought in the southern parts. The way in which it's been handled is simply by infrastructure rather than by a multiple planning program of use and infrastructure brought together into a framework. So however complex the financing systems are now being talked about, they still don't work because they're being used to offset actual political decisions. Um, the, I guess the point I would like to make really, it, it builds on a couple of the slides that um, I think it was uh, Jerome Fox showed um, in the presentation, uh, which looked at the disturbances in, one was in Brazil, I can't remember where the other one was. And essentially, if we look back over the last uh, two years, of course, we're all familiar with the um, the Arab Spring, uh, the, the, the wave of civil unrest which has swept right across uh, North Africa. And it seems to me that, that there's a danger in our discussions here that they're simply unduly technocratic. And, and the, to me, the key thing which is missing, if you like, from not from your list, but from the discussion today, is the issue fundamentally of distributional outcomes and the political process processes which generate those. So we can have all manner of wonderful investment criteria and innovative financing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, simulation computer modeling, but 
uh, if at the end of the day, a large chunk of society are basically ending up with little or nothing, I don't think we're going to be doing more than scratching the surface. Jerome, do you want to have a response? Well, I, 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 think I, I would absolutely agree with you. And I suppose the point I was making by declaring myself as a useless project manager at the beginning. No, no criticism of your project. No, absolutely. I, I would absolutely concur with you. I think one of the big risks, actually, is that we we over we apply systems and tools to the running of projects, or even the definition of projects, mm. uh, and ignore the kind of the human factor, which, and, and actually it was interesting in the last week talking about bringing together the different systems in one place and big data. I think one of the success, the other, one of the other successes of London's Olympics was the way in which data sources were brought to play to, together in one place. But not, not the technical success of that, but the drove success. It was the fact that they also then brought all the, the uh, organizations responsible for managing London into one uh, building and made them look at one screen, which had all of that data integrated on it. And the, the bringing together of the humans to work with each other whilst reacting to the data was far more powerful than actually the, 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 the power of the data itself, if you like. And I think that's, that, there, there, I'm making two points there. there, are two, there there's not always a technical solution that brings about you know, that sort of transformation change. It's often the human factor. And my point in my, my presentation, I don't know whether I made it clearly, is expressing um, the, the reason why, perhaps the outcome as to why we're spending huge sums of money on, on innovations or on uh, infrastructure, I think needs to be re-explained re -explained to some degree because we're talking to the middle classes who are groups of individuals or, or actually individuals with very different points of view but applying kind of consumer-based value principles to projects and choices. Can I, can I follow that up as, as the environmental scientist here? Well, one observation is technical and one that's kind of more conceptual. The more conceptual one, I think, fits very well. As river restorers, and I'm, I'm a river restorer some of the time, we're increasingly seeing that the science base for river restoration is being downplayed. It's becoming less important. And that what communities want is a community solution. And so, as a scientist, I'm often being asked, well, how do we achieve the vision that we want to see? Even though I think I can tell them that environmentally that vision is suboptimal. Okay, so we, we have this idea that once the scientist was kind of at the top of a ladder of, of expertise informing the public and deciding, hence the technocratic type now we think much more we're in a kind of a wheel or round table, where at the very most we co-equal with what people want. So the move to localism, the move towards um, transparency, the move actually to citizen science and data gathering has actually had some interesting consequences for the kinds of projects that are actually robust in the long term, by which I mean have public credibility and public acceptance. And I think that's more of a challenge, and you could twist that even further if you look at the distributional consequences and the constituencies involved. The technical point I was going to make is that about 10 years ago, uh, a methodology which some of you will know, the ecosystem goods and services concept came into play. And this was the idea that the physical environment, the biological environment, um, the service functions of soils, water, vegetation, crayfish, whatever you've got in your environment, could be put into an economic metric in a transferable manner which would allow professionals to essentially have a single unit of currency. A lot of that early work was done by economists essentially looking at the environment. Strangely enough, much of the development work was done by physical scientists sort of fumbling around, trying to make it work. But I think it's still a real opportunity but actually some really engaged work that's cross-disciplinary to revisit that kind of concept, despite the fact it kind of goes back. And it, that's another technocratic kind of instrument. So, my observation. Good. Uh, Sabine? So, what I'm encouraging is people to just talk across the room. So, uh, we're talking in a way that allows the dialogue to extend. Yeah. I was a bit alarmed about the diagnosis middle class and big projects. We do have special big problems in Germany with, with the middle class, but you can't say the middle class is the problem. What we have That's is, you, you remember, that Elke Lamouni started with 70 million, uh, 70 million euros. It's an opera house, an opera house. And now it's one billion, close to one billion. No one in Hamburg is complaining, not, not one person. And they are 
definitely middle class, upper middle class. Stuttgart, okay, they are now up to six to seven billion from starting three to four. But what I'm expecting from the scientific community is the evaluation of the situation so that we do better understand what are the certain turning points where the process, which seem to be similar, turns in other directions. Because this would help other cities not to make a blue, use, use it as a blueprint, but to have a better consciousness about what can happen, why was it happening to another person, and this is what we are learning when we are working with cities. They like, like to have the exchange with colleagues. So what we should use is more to enhance forums where people with the same profession, with the same attitude, with the same um, background are going to have an exchange, a collegial exchange. That's the best way to make understand how the process inside your administration, your community is running right or wrong. And that helps a lot. We do have some model projects in Germany where it's experienced and it's really helping. So I would ask the scientific community stronger to look at what is happening, why, than what could happen. So you want that scenarios planning. Just to go back and make, link it to Nick's point, can, does anybody have any response to that question of the deliberative process by which we can have engagement, therefore the principle of engagement, which recognises the ways in which different class values or different individual sector responses have got a participatory desire to be involved and yet it's over, over driving some of the processes. So the relationship between local experts and generic and scientific experts is actually finding a difficult relationship at the moment and politicians are choosing one path rather than the other. Is there anybody on that? Well, just, just one very yep. quick example. Um, I think big data has potential to allow citizens to participate and share their data in ways that let, let them take better decisions. And, but my, my favorite example is in San Francisco with the cycling network and infrastructure. You know, previously, to decide where to put their cycling money, they stopped cyclists once a year. There were half a dozen people with clipboards, stopped people on the streets and said, you know, where, where are you going? And someone said, someone said, we're San Francisco. So they worked with all the big cycling organizations in the city, got them to download an app, and they collected over nine months real-time data of how people actually use the city, a huge cloud of data that was collaboratively done by the cyclists and the city administration that then allowed them to do two things. First of all, produce an amazing city cycling map because thousands of cyclists have found the best routes to follow contours across a very hilly city. Um, so they've produced a fantastic map. And then they also knew where to invest the money in cycling infrastructure. And then year on year, they could start to see the trends. So there's an example of how citizen data can help citizens to together make a better decision that I, that I think is scientifically um, you know, for, for them more valid in, in that infrastructure term and, and, and do it more efficiently. Well, the Peter's example is very interesting because uh, you have a community, in this case of cyclists, where there's a benefit to everybody from collaboration. Uh, <coughs> I think in terms of wanting you know, better scientific analysis to uh, facilitate uh, a community stroke political process, uh, I mean, there are formal foundations in that that everybody will be aware of. It uh, goes back to the 1960s on big projects of cost benefit analysis. So you can do a social and the economic cost benefit analysis, and you can articulate uh, the cost and benefit for actually different sections of the community. Um, and of course, what it will do most of the time, like the easy example, is, is to show you that parts of the community are benefiting, and those for whom it's actually a cost. And so I was actually thinking when Peter Hall was talking this morning um, about all these transport projects, um, you know, and I, I, I love the talk. What Peter <coughs> did do uh, was talk about uh, the routes through which new transport projects are going to be driven. So you know, they're going to be losers, as it were, on those routes. 
And then if we're all economists, we'd then say, well, you have to run away and compensate the losers. Um, but it's never as simple as that. So, I mean, I, I, I think you know, we always have to recognize that the science is the best knowledge to inform the problem, and that can lead in the cost-benefit analysis, simulation, scenario time. And then there's politics. And it's how you actually join that up, and that's yeah. non-trivial. So yeah. we can't how we can't just believe that there's an easy way of solving that uh, question, but we still have to strive to have the best information base that will facilitate that political. Maybe that's a good place to, to finish. We have run out of time, unfortunately, but the notion that there are various tools like cost-benefit analysis or scenarios planning is a crucial dimension of how we work. And of course, the principles engaged in something like cost-benefit analysis, you've linked to what Nick just said, is that it's what is the cost and how do you measure it? And if you measure it simply in economic terms, then you're going to have a different sense of cost if you measure it in cultural terms. And yeah. those are foundational issues. And as you said, they're not trivial. Thank you. We have our last speaker.